Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We'd like to welcome you again to another session of the Doctrine and Covenants Roundtable. This particular section, we will be talking about sections uh, 66, 67, and 68. Joining me this hour is Dr. Craig Mansell of Church History and Doctrine, also uh, Dr. Randy Bott of Church History and Doctrine, and also Dr. Steve Harper of Church History and Doctrine. These are all professors in that department, uh, as, uh, as I am also, and my name is Susan Black. As we start out with section 66, uh, we've got it in October 25th of 1831 in Orange, Ohio. It has much to do with William McClellan. Steve, would you like to tell us about this man and what's going on? Sure. In the last decade, we've learned an enormous amount of information that changes some of what we thought we knew about this, including the date that you mentioned and the place in which it was received. From the history of the church, that seems to be the logical inference. But William McClellan's journal says that it was received on the 29th of October, 1831, at Hiram, Ohio, where he had accompanied the prophet to his home. And in that setting, having been uh, sprained his ankle on the way home and having been healed by the prophet of that, he now seeks uh, a revelation from Joseph Smith. And we know from some other things he wrote that he asked the Lord five questions, which he kept secret from the prophet. He said, I desired it as a testimony of Joseph's inspiration. And he also testified, and this comes 10 years after he's uh, completely disaffected from the prophet, and in fact has come out as an open critic of Joseph Smith. He says, though, every question I lodged in the ears of the Lord was answered to my full and entire satisfaction. I consider it to me evidence I cannot refute, which is powerful. And it makes this otherwise relatively mundane 13 verse mission call deeply significant. Uh, both for what it, it says and for the way in which it was conveyed by the Lord through the prophet Joseph Smith. We wonder, what were those five questions? He, he kept them secret. I think probably, if not all of them, were deeply private in nature. But we simply can't know what they are. We can make maybe some educated guesses based on what the Lord uh, Craig, would you like to make some perhaps educated guesses here? Well, uh, I'll jump in on verse 2. Um, one of the questions might deal with the first sentence there. Verily I say unto you, blessed art you for receiving mine everlasting covenants, even the fullness of my gospel. Uh, I, I think William at one time uh, in his early days of the church when he was investigating it and his great four-hour conversation with Hiram down in Missouri about the church, is this the church? The question, is this the church uh, that was uh, prophesied in, by Old Testament prophets and that would, fork, uh, would, be, would come forth in the latter days. Is this Daniel's, uh, you know, kingdom of God set up in the latter days? And the Savior tells him, this is the fullness of my gospel. It is it. And you've joined it. You're a part of it. Uh, okay, good. That, that sounds like a very reasonable uh, guess. Randy, you want to add to that? Well, I just wonder if, uh, if verse number three happened to be... Uh, part of it, and, and again, we're speculating a little bit, but uh, he probably had the question uh, that I know I've done some things wrong. I wonder if I've really been forgiven of all of my sins. And uh, what the Lord says to him here is, I think, has broad application for all of us as well. He said, my servant, William, you're clean, but not all. Uh, in other words, some, there's some things probably that you still need to, to, to address that you haven't at this point. And William may have very well have said, well, uh, you know, how, how, how would I know what they are? He said, repent, therefore, of those things that are not pleasing in my sight, saith the Lord, for the Lord will show them unto you. 
and I see that happening all the time in my own life and the life of the students, is that the Lord doesn't leave us out there to wonder uh, how we stand with Him. He's willing to reveal to us through promptings and inspiration on the areas that we still need to improve on. What the revelation does that he probably didn't expect was he received more than he yeah. asked for. <laughs> Which fact, is very common. <laughs> I, am I clean? Well, let yeah, me yeah. tell you, I will show you where you're not clean. Uh, I will show them unto you. Uh, you know. Okay, nevertheless, it does appear that he's called to go on a mission. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it in the eastern lands and what he's going to be able to do there, Steve. Well, by the eastern lands, the Lord presumably means the area east of where they're gathered for this conference in Hiram, Ohio. Now, immediately following this revelation, several of the leading elders of the church gather for almost a two-week-long conference at Hiram. And it's there that en enormously um, important things take place, the revelations that are now 1 and 133 and other things. Well, right after that conference, McClellan obeys this commandment. Tarry not many days in this place, verse 6 says, Go not up to the land of Zion as yet. Maybe that was one of his questions. I Should I gather to Missouri? Yes. Seems Shall I likely. gather to Missouri? But inasmuch as you can send, send, Lord, meaning if you have extra money. If you've got extra surplus money, send it to Bishop Partridge. Otherwise, don't worry about your property. Instead, go on a mission. Bear testimony in every place, to every people, in their synagogues, reasoning with the people. That's an, an interesting, unique commandment, to reason with the people. Only he and Orson Hyde get that commission to reason. It may have something to do with their particular gifts. They're eloquent, they're lo logicians to somewhat, some, some kind. It's interesting to me that the Lord couples both of them at different times with Samuel Smith in verse 8. Uh, Craig, who was the Samuel Smith? Well, Samuel Smith is the younger brother of the prophet Joseph, and so uh, he's the first missionary of the church in the early days in the New York period and so a great missionary in himself you might even say he would be the senior companion in this uh, tandem that was going mm -hmm. to go out. Good. All right he's also told verse 10 don't be uh, cumbered. What, what's that Steve? Well I think that there is enough circumstantial evidence to make a case that the Lord means by seek not to be cumbered don't be married and take on family obligations since I've commanded you to go out and serve a mission. We know that William McClellan has been recently widowed. Mm -hmm. His wife died maybe in childbirth. He may be asking, should I get remarried and that sort of uh, thing? Maybe even in connection with, I'm, it's tough not to be adulterous if I'm not married, should I be remarried? And the Lord says, seek not to be cumbered. We base that guess on a letter that Joseph Smith wrote to Emma Smith in June of 1832, where he accuses uh, William McClellan of forsaking the Lord, for letting, uh, forsaking this revelation, and b exact, explicitly by marrying Emmeline Miller. So it's by being married that Joseph Smith feels that McClellan failed to keep the commandments given. Susan, up on just Good. verse 9, can we slip up there? This might be another one of the questions. Uh, lay your hands upon the sick. What gifts, you might have asked, what gifts do I have? Uh, what And how should I develop those gifts or talents? Well, and see, he may have been particularly tuned into that in as much as he had been the recipient of, of, of healing before. And then, and then we do have record that he used the gift of healing on his missions. Yeah, in fact, it's his missionary journal which follows this is in some ways so explicit that I believe he was uh, consciously accounting to the Lord, keeping track. For instance, lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover, verse 9 says. Mm -hmm. One of his journal entries is, I laid my hands upon her and she was restored to health. Mm -hmm. he, the Lord tells him, be patient in affliction. He writes over and over again, I endured it patiently. It was cold. He baptized people through the ice. He got sick. It seems as if he's accounting for his obedience to the revelation. Mm. But I think part of the, uh, the thing that uh, Craig was mentioning earlier, he got more than he wanted, was when the Lord, and you don't want to have a, a, that revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, <laughs> when the Lord says, by the way, watch out for adultery, a temptation with which thou hast been troubled. It's like announcing <laughs> it in my thoughts. <laughs> How serious is this? Okay, good point. We now move on to section 67, also in Hiram, Ohio. 
Uh, Craig, do you want to talk to us about witnesses and what is this about revelations? Yes. You know, again, as Steve has mentioned, uh, this is the beginning of this important conference where Joseph Smith over the past uh, number of months has been collecting the many revelations that she's received from the beginning of the church and compiling them. And uh, elders have been brought together, 10 of them in number, and they've convened a conference. Now, what Joseph has done, he has promised them a like witness such as the three witnesses had for the Book of Mormon. This witness would be a manifestation of the truthfulness of these revelations so that they could sign a, an affidavit of some sort that would verify the truthfulness in a, such a way that they could not doubt, such as the three witnesses. And so it is that uh, this is the events that it brings this revelation about. What's happened now, if I can pick up a couple of verses here uh, that will verify this, Verse 1, Behold and hearken, O ye elders of my church, who have assembled yourselves, whose prayers I have heard. So they've been praying for the manifestation, whose hearts I have known. And this is actually, uh, according to William E. McClellan's journal, one of the ones who was there, said we had uh, been praying for through uh, the whole night and through the day before for this manifestation. But lo, mine eyes are upon you, and the heavens and the earth and mine hands. Ye endeavored, you ten men, to believe that you should receive a blessing which was offered you, Joseph offered you, but behold, verily I say unto you, there were fears in your hearts. So why didn't they receive it? We don't have any records such as, you know, Moroni appearing to the three witnesses. There were fears in their hearts was one of the reasons why they were denied this great blessing. And you know, I think that same thing is true of so many people that are seeking a blessing at the hands of the Lord today. Who should I marry? What should I be uh, as far as a, a career? And they're afraid. Uh, and, and as a result of that, fear seems to block the answer to prayer. Exactly. Yeah. Nice Revelation application. Is, um, can be intimidating. Uh, we diligently seek it. We want to know the Lord's will. And then sometimes we find ourselves not wanting to know because it requires an action <laughs> uh, and accountability. Know, he always stretches us beyond mm -hmm. what, what we think we're capable of doing. I think that's why maybe we fear somewhat there. Okay, as the people feared, it appears, verse 6, uh, Now seek ye out of the book of commandments, even the least that is among them, and appoint him that is most wise among you. What's, what's that about? Steve, do you want to? Sure. The Lord yeah. seems to offer them here a, um, a way to confirm their faith and to maybe help them overcome this fear. It may be that part of what's causing them to be fearful is the idea of putting these revelations out there and having them be criticized because they, they, they don't think they're as eloquent as they might be and their language is rough and so forth. So the Lord here says to take, take this book of commandments or take the collection of the revelations, find the one that's easiest to duplicate, pick the smartest one among you, and if you can duplicate it, then you are not obligated to testify that they're divine, but otherwise you are. Okay, who... who attempted then to uh, try and uh, well I think Help sometimes we misalign William E. McClellan in this case. We, while it was true, he was uh, it said he was the wisest amongst them and tried to. He's been a school states. teacher. Well, he yeah. was. He was the educated amongst them, and he makes the attempt to write this, and all through the evening he does, and he fails in that attempt. So yes, it's William E. McClellan. You know, the thing that we we fail to realize is that the words are one thing. It's the spirit that bears witness of them that we cannot duplicate. Right. They may seem superficially uh, much less than they are, but anybody who spends a lot of time with the revelations, I think, is deeply impressed at their, at their divinity and their complexity. Okay. I've noticed as you look back in the uh, testimony of the 12 apostles, but the year on this is 1831, where the 12 apostles, the one that then uh, indicated their testimony that this was a true work. Mm. Yeah, see, in verse 5, the Lord says, uh, Your eyes have been upon my servant Joseph. And the, and the verse 4, it says, The testimony of the truth of these commandments, these revelations, will come through who now? Joseph. So you're going to get your uh, revelation through the words of Joseph telling you that they're true. And that's what's happening. The Lord tells him in verse, now look in verse 9, For ye know that there is no unrighteousness in them, meaning these revelations, future book of commandments, and that which is righteousness coming down from above and the father of lights. 
And that's initially attested to by these 10 men at the conference who we know from the history of the church, McClellan attempts, fails, and becomes willing along with the others to, mm. to attest that the revelations are divine. What we have now in the beginning of our Doctrine and Covenants is the testimony of the 12 apostles who are not called until 1835. Right. So that original testimony of these 10 has been okay, and superseded, the ten being apparently. Orson Hyde, William McClellan, Luke Johnson, Lyman Johnson, Joseph Smith Sr., Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, Peter Whitmer Jr., Sidney Rigdon. Those were the original right. 10. And apparently they sent an affidavit down with the Book of Commandments signed by these men. And then when the, the, it was destroyed, uh, with, uh, the, when the press was destroyed and the Book of Commandments was on that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that was lost. So we don't have that affidavit. Okay, these That'd men. Be a nice find. It? It would yeah, be, it would yeah. be a great find. These men, uh, Randy, as we look at verses 11 through 14, it's obvious they're they're hoping for some great gift of the Spirit. Can I go back to 10 and pick sure. up because he's saying, now look, if you really want a spiritual manifestation, Spirit. here's some things that you really need to do. And he says, it is a, it's a privilege and a promise that I give unto you who have been ordained into this ministry that inasmuch as you strip yourselves of your jealousies and then strip yourself of your fears, mm -hmm. then humble yourself before me because you're not sufficiently humble. Then he says, if you'll do those three things, the veil shall be rent and you shall see me and know that I am. And then the warning, not with the natural or the carnal, neither the natural mind, but with the spiritual. And then he talks about the fact that you're not in a position right now to receive the type of manifestation that you would like to receive. No man has seen God at any time except quickened by the Spirit of God. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God, neither after the carnal mind. Then he said, ye are not able to abide the presence of God not now, neither the ministry of angels. Wherefore, continue on, keep on going in the direction yeah. that you're going until ye are perfected. Let not your minds turn back. Don't keep going back and rehashing this. And when ye are worthy in mine own due time, ye shall see and know. Know what Joseph saw and knows. That's right. Exactly. McClellan's writings reveal that he, and we may assume some of these others, were very desirous to experience the things that Joseph had experienced yes. for himself. McClellan wants to re reveal, to receive revelations, and Joseph at times encourages him in that quest. McClellan wants to see ministering angels. And it's a frustrated quest for him. He acknowledges in his journal that he sometimes gives in to what he calls sore temptations and so forth. And so this quest to become perfected and to receive these blessings, I appreciate that the Lord is encouraging them in this quest and that McClellan is clean, not all maybe, but he's clean and he can repent and receive a crown of eternal life if he will do these things that, uh, that are explicitly outlined. Strip himself and the others as well. Strip yourselves of jealousies, fears, get humble, and the same kind of experiences that Joseph had, you Good. can have. As we go on to 68, we find McClellan kind of strings all three of these sections. Notice it's a revelation given also in Hiram, Ohio, uh, the same time to Orson Hyde, Luke S. Johnson, Lyman Johnson, and William McClellan, all future apostles. Randy, do you want to start out with uh, first one, uh, one, and tell us about Orson Hyde? Later. Well, I just uh, I don't know as much about Orson Hyde as much as I know that he was sent forth as a missionary, and probably in any single verse in Scripture, this one outlines the responsibility that we have as missionaries as we go out. And you could put your name in there. It says, my servant, and here it was Orson Hyde, was called by his ordination. And, and see, we don't just go out just because we're moved upon and we feel like we ought to. We need to be called and ordained to that. Two, to proclaim the everlasting gospel. You don't go out and teach your own ideas or your own philosophy. And number three, you're to do it by the spirit of the living God from people to people and from land to land in the congregations of the wicked in their synagogues. Number four, reasoning with, it because the gospel is extremely reasonable. You know, and, and so we should be able to logically figure this out and expounding all scriptures unto them. If we could get our missionaries and our members to do those five things, 
there, we would we would increase our effectiveness as a, as missionaries tenfold. It sounds like we're raising the bar of missionary it work. It sounds just like in 1831 scripture. they were raising the bar. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know those elements are common to so many of the revelations. This is a restatement of the qualifications for missionary service. This commandment to reason is somewhat unique. Uh, again, I think maybe it's an acknowledgement that Orson Hyde has this capacity, and it's significant to me that he, again, is coupled with Samuel Smith from time to time. It seems like the perfect missionary yeah, companionship. Yeah. Yeah. And very successful, we know, from the records they kept. We might take from this verse also, they, in their synagogues, usually we'll, we associate synagogues with uh, the Jewish uh, religion, and uh, later on, as we know, Orson Hyde is called to Israel uh, to dedicate the Holy Land. Uh, also, perhaps, Craig, once again, where it says, verse 4, and whatsoever you shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be scripture. Yes. Uh, you know, this is an important verse uh, when you're trying to, def the definition of what scripture is. It, uh, when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And so when our, when the brethren speak in general conference, they don't need to say, thus saith the Lord. When they're moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it's scripture. Uh, our insight is, in a sense, a, a Latter-day scripture to us. And so this definition was important for them in this day, that this is an ensign unto them that they shall speak as moved upon. So you can't underestimate the importance of following the Spirit when you're moved upon it. That's a powerful idea, uh, the living Word of God. And it's an idea that has got people's heads chopped off at various times in history to say that, that God not only has spoken, but that He continues, continues to, to speak, speak through us or through the, the leaders, those who speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the will of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. And then the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. You know, and, and I love uh, uh, J. Reuben Clark's insight that the way we can tell when they're speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost is if we ourselves have the Holy Ghost with us. Mm -hmm. So the burden really gets shifted from them to us. <laughs> Very much so. Okay, it does so, and it, it tells us as we do it, verse 6, maybe Randy, back to you. I think you like again. the saying, be of good cheer. <laughs> I, I love these scriptures here because these missionary, missionary work can be really depressing. And as he sends them out over and over and over again, he says, be of good cheer. Do not fear, for I, the Lord, am with you. I'll stand by you. You know, just keep on going. Don't, don't let it get you down. And, and you, every time he mentions missionaries, he keeps saying, don't get down the mouth. And I think that the, uh, the, the inclination to become de discouraged when the congregations of the wicked do not embrace what we're saying is, is really prevalent. Mm. Very encouraging there, too. The reasons to not fear or not be discouraged are because Jesus is with them. I'll stand by you, and I'm the son of the living God. I was, I am, and I am to come. I mean, who can fail under those circumstances? Okay, great comments. Verse 12 talks about sealing. Uh, Craig, do you want to take that one? And, and as many as the Father shall bear, bear a record, to you shall be given power to seal them up unto eternal life. Well, these missionaries who had been called... Um, there are, you know, a, a number of the ones that mentioned in the first, they've all been gone out to, to uh, they've been all called out to do their missionary work. And verse 8 says, go you into all the world, preach the gospel in every, to every creature and acting in authority. I will give to you the baptizing in the name so, uh, and of the Holy Ghost. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not will be damned. And he that believeth shall be blessed with signs following, even as it is written. And and unto you, then, it shall be given to know the signs of the times and the signs of the, of the coming of the Son of Man. And of as many as the Father shall bear record to you shall be given the power to seal them up into eternal life. The power of the priesthood will seal them up into eternal life. Good. It then goes on to speak about bishops and eventually literal descendants of Aaron. This seems like a whole new revelation. and We know that it comes at a later date, the break being between 12 and 13 a whole different discussion of bishops and the office of a bishop, which is different than our ward bishops today. There aren't any ward bishops at this time in the church. The Lord speaks here of those who are the, the keepers of the storehouse, those who are charged okay. with the temporal affairs uh -huh. of the church. Good. Uh, comments on uh, descendants of Aaron? 
Right. Uh, here, verse 16, and if they be literal descendants of Aaron, they shall have a legal right to the bishopric if they are the firstborn among the sons of Aaron. Sometimes this is misunderstood that we think it has to do with the office of bishop uh, or in the church, rather that Aaron, by legal right, being of the, uh, the priesthood, the holy priesthood, and had the right of the high priest amongst the tribe of Levi, was passed down on the birthright from the firstborn. Now, this then has been reestablished in the dispensation of the fullness of times. This doctrine is brought back to us here, that someone who is of a literal descent has claim upon that. Well, we know that uh, that would come through a patriarchal blessing, would be one way to declare that descent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joseph Fielding Smith has stated that there have been blessings uh, in this dispensation of individuals who've been declared of that descent. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't mean that they can go in and demand uh, this particular uh, office or position. Verse 20 says, they must also be designated by the yes. first presidency, found worthy and ordained. The same procedure applies to them, even That's though right. there's this legal claim on it. Good point. There's also some strong advice for, for parents. Randy, you want to verse 25. Boy, there is for sure. Starting from 25 all the way down to 31, that parents have children in Zion. In other words, they're members of the church that are to uh, teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, baptism, the Holy Ghost. There's your four basic principles and ordinances of the gospel by the time they're eight years old. Then the sin of not teaching them would be upon the heads of the parents. And then he goes on to say, children need to be baptized for the remission of their sins when eight years of age. And we need to teach our children to pray and to walk uprightly before the Lord and really to observe the Sabbath day and remember your labors. And, and that fact that our children are growing up in idleness and, that's, and wickedness, and that's not pleasing to him and that we need to change. Their eyes are full of greediness. Yeah, that's right. Well, by verse 32... Oliver Cowdery is told to carry these sayings. Uh, tell us about that, Steve. Well, this is the commandment for Oliver to take the commandments. They've just had conference. As one of the key issues of the conference was to decide what to do with the commandments or the revelations. They called them commandments often. So he's now to take these revelations, carry them to Missouri, where they will then go into publication. William Phelps has got a printing office established there. and. They will print the revelations. We know that they, they uh, are frustrated in that goal by the persecutions of the summer of 1833. And we'll soon learn that someone will be asked to join him in another revelation, John Whitmer, as a companion uh, on that uh, journey down there. Good. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful insights about the Doctrine and Covenants sections. Uh, we've covered 66, section 67, and 68. Uh, thank you very much, Professors Mansell, Bott, and Harper. Thank you. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.